Good afternoon, everyone. The lights in the National Library Theatre have dimmed, which is our cue to welcome you all here this afternoon. My name is Catherine Favell. I'm Director of Reader Services, and I'm delighted to see many of you here in the room today, but I would equally like to welcome those of, us, those of you who are joining us online, either through our live stream or on Catch Up. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging Australia's First Nations people, the traditional owners and custodians of this land, and give my respects to Elders past and present, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Thank you for joining us. We're coming to you from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, where it's still a grey and rainy day, um, but we're hoping that the sun will be shining in the theatre today as we discover the outcomes of one of our National Library Research Fellows. This afternoon's presentation, Spiritualist West, Magical Orient, Theosophists and India, 1875 to 1950, is by Dr. Sagata Nandi, our 2020 National Library of Australia Fellow. Our Distinguished Fellowships Program supports researchers to make intensive use of the National Library's collections through residencies of three months. National Library of Australia fellowships are only possible through the generous support of our philanthropic community. And today I'd like to pay particular acknowledgement to the Stokes family who have supported Dr Nandy's fellowship and, and in fact support three fellowships annually. Now, many of our fellows this year have been on wild and wonderful journeys to get here. Um, Sugata, I think, may actually win the prize, though. He was awarded the fellowship in 2020. Of course, we all know what happened after that. His home base is in Kolkata, India. And then there were times, I think, this year, right up until about the end of June, when um, I suspect Sugata didn't think he was going to make it here, and we had some serious doubts as well. But it's been an absolute pleasure to have him as part of our Fellows community, working in the library, in the Special Collections Reading Room, in the Fellows Room, on a daily basis. In his presentation today, Sagata will present his research on Theosophists and India. In 1875, the Theosophical Society was founded in New York, a spiritualist organisation that by the 1900s enjoyed a global presence. Some of you may be familiar with some very famous theosophists, like L. Frank Bohm, author of The Wizard of Oz, um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and T.S. Eliot. Today we're going to hear what Sugata has uncovered in the library's collections and how that's going to contribute to his research. Please welcome Sagata Nandi. Thank you, Catherine, for that very generous introduction. I begin with thanking the National Library for giving me this privilege to uh, come and work here and to present my findings with you. Uh, as Catherine just said, uh, till about the middle of this year, I wasn't sure that I'm go I was going to make it. And I'm very happy that I'm here and I could work here. Uh, the experience has been absolutely fascinating, or uh, should I say magical, completely. OK, so uh, my time period, I have shortened it slightly you might have noticed uh, on the library website, it's 1875. It uh, begins, at 18, begins in 1875, and I end at 1930. And my, my presentation is titled, as you see, Spiritualist West, Magical Orient. Spiritualism, meaning communication with spirits of the deceased with the help of mediums, arose in America in 1848, and quickly spread all over the West and to the European settler colonies. In 1879, as two spiritualists, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Henry Steele Alcott, arrived in Bombay from New York, Western spiritualism turned to the East. Blavatsky and Alcott's Theosophical Society, a spiritualist organization formed in New York, made India its home and her ancient wisdom the sole object of its quest. India had by then acquired the reputation of a magical land, or the proverbial magical orient. 
whom to feed said phenomena which were beyond the powers of Western science to explain. Accounts of such occurrences appeared in ever-increasing numbers in the popular press in the West, leading many to believe in them, while others debunked them as lies and fraud. Against such a background, Blavatsky claimed that India was home to magic, or what she called the science of sciences, a higher knowledge lost to humanity. While in India, she attracted a large following by performing inexplicable or magical feats and phenomena, and later used the publicity she found thereby to offer her followers a body of knowledge, which formed the core of theosophy, with concepts eclectically chosen from Hinduism and Buddhism, two of India's ancient religions. Blavatsky died in 1891, when the Theosophical Society was already spreading to many countries of the Western world. And by 1912, it, it, uh, it had established itself in more than 25 countries, thus becoming the largest spiritualist organization in the world. In my talk today, I will highlight the way the founders of the society, which is Blavatsky and Olcott, and particularly Blavatsky, manipulated magical phenomena and the myths of Indian magic while she was in India to lay the foundation of a quasi-religious and philosophical body of knowledge, which we know by the name Theosophy. Blavatsky's life, though thoroughly researched, is full of mysteries. She was born Helena Petrovna Han in 1831 in present-day Ukraine to a Russian aristocratic family of German descent. Her father, Peter Alexeyevich Han, was a colonel in the Russian army, and a mother, Andreyevna de Fadiev, was a novelist who died early, leaving her in the care of her maternal parents at the age of nine. Her initiation to the world of occultism happened at the library of Prince Pravel Dolgoruki, her mother's maternal great-grandfather, an aristocratic Freemason of Catherine the Great's time. Blavatsky, uh, sorry, she from all uh, surviving records appears to have been a very impulsive girl who at the age of 17, at the age of 17 in 1848, married Nikolai Blavatsky, a Russian noble, aged, who was then aged 42. A year later, she left her husband, though without dissolving her marriage, and traveled to Istanbul in Turkey and then to Cairo in Egypt. Her travels, associations, acquaintances, and activities till 1858, when she returned to Russia to join her family, remain unclear. But it's well known that she acquired mediumistic skills by that time. She briefly rejoined her husband in the mid-1860s uh, uh, mid and then left him again to spend the rest of the decade traveling through Eastern and Southern Europe. In 1871, she went to Cairo, stayed there, stayed there for over a year. In the spring of 1873, she went to Paris and from there left for New York. Before leaving Cairo, she became a member of an occult group called the Brotherhood of Lakja. Upon arriving in New York, as Olcott says, she faced hardship due to the dearth of money. She met Olcott in 1874 at Chitenden, Vermont, at the Eddie Brothers residence, known at the time for spirit materialization during seances. Henry Steele Olcott, born Henry Olcott to a Presbyterian farmer family of New Jersey in 1832, was a successful agriculturist by his early 20s. As Stephen Prothero says, as Stephen Prothero says, he took, a, he took a keen interest in spiritualism from an early age while pursuing his material objectives. He had worked his way up, having to toil as an agricultural laborer in his teens after being forced to give up studies. Later, he moved to New York at the age of 20, at the age of 21, sorry, to become a big, big city journalist. And even uh, after some time, he turned into an agricultural entrepreneur. He took a degree in law afterwards, and at the time of the American Civil War, enlisted in the Union Army and earned the rank of Cornell. His job was to examine and regulate army supplies to prevent embezzlement and corruption, which he carried out with success. He was known for being close to Abraham Lincoln. Olcott was introduced to seances uh, of early spiritualists in America as a teenager, and by the age of 20, he had become a self-proclaimed spiritualist. He had eclectically drawn from Christianity and other religions, other religions to form his own religious liberalism and displayed 
and interest in Asian religions and cultures. When he met Blavatsky, Olcott was already a firm believer in, firm believer in the ability of mediums to communicate, with, to communicate with and manifest spirits of the dead. Blavatsky's charismatic persona left an indelible impression on, on Olcott from the time of their first meeting. Her occult powers awed him, and with her, he un unsuccessfully tried to form the Miracle Club, an organization to investigate psychic phenomena in early 1875. Blavatsky's New York apartment, which she named the Lama Seri, hinting at an albeit untrue Tibetan connection, at the time had become the site of regular gathering of people interested in such phenomena and occultism in general. After one such gathering on September 7th, 1875, a parlor meeting typical of aristocrats and haute bourgeois of the Victorian world, Alcott came up with the idea of forming a society for the study of similar subjects, like occultism, psychic phenomena, and the other. And Blavatsky approved of it. Accordingly, a body was formed in the apartment on uh, 17th of November, 1875, which was termed, which was named the Theosophical Society. Alcott, in his memoir, says that after tossing aside suggestions to christen their association Egyptological, Hermetic, Rosicrucian, everyone agreed to call it the Theosophical Society. As Charles Sotheran, an American rare book expert, picked the word theosophy from a dictionary. The term theosophy, derived from Greek roots theos and sophia, literally me meant divine knowledge. And according to Antoine Favre, corresponds to, just a second, to the project that begins to take shape during the Renaissance, and above all, though not exclusively, in Germanic countries. It came up among devout Christians in reaction to the divorce between faith and knowledge which took place during the Renaissance. It relied heavily on notable personalities, and by the mid-19th century, it was deteriorating with little or no influence. The Theosophical Society was not and did not claim itself to be a legacy of the pre-existing and declining theosophy. Blavatsky defined the term theosophia as, I quote, wisdom religion or divine wisdom, the substratum and basis of all world religion and philosophies, taught and practiced by a few elect since man became a thinking being. In its practical bearing, theosophy is purely divine ethics. At, the, at first, the purpose of the Theosophical Society was the scientific investigation of psychic or so-called spiritualistic phenomena. At the time of foundations, the society undertook three objectives, which were the quest for psychic self, opposition to materialism in science and theology, and advancing oriental religion and under brotherhood against Christianity. These were tactfully redrawn in 1881 to become, as you see uh, uh, in the sl uh, slide on display, to form a nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity, to study Aryan literature, religion, and science, to vindicate the importance of this inquiry and correct misinterpretations with which it has been clouded to explore the hidden mysteries of nature and the latent powers of man on which the founders believe that oriental philosophy is in a position to throw light. These were further changed in 1890, and it became, <coughs> excuse me, and they became one to form the nucleus of a universal, to form the uh, nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, color, caste, or uh, sorry, race, creed, sex, caste, or color. Two, to promote the, the study of Aryan and other Eastern literatures, religions, philosophies, and sciences, and to demonstrate their importance to humanity. Three, to investigate unexplored laws of nature and the psychic powers latent in man. These objectives evidently had a universal appeal in the fin the Siècle world, but the Theosophical Society's success in growing into a global spiritual organization was due mainly to Blavatsky's inexplicable or magical feats which she performed while she was in India, and her much publicized claim of having been given those powers, given powers to produce that, such phenomena by her teachers, 
whom she called the invisible masters, who manifested themselves while she was there in India. When Blavatsky and Olcott went to India, their avowed objective was to retrieve ancient wisdom. They believed that there was an ancient wisdom which had been lost to humanity, especially due to a dense materialism of modern science. To which Blavatsky added, there was an, and to which Blavatsky added, there was an invisible brotherhood or of masters or adepts who were men, not gods, in possession of ancient wisdom, who lived up to, uh, who lived up to trem tremendous age, were capable of as astral travel, could materialize when necessary, and communicated with initiates or disciples through letters and notes which appeared out of nowhere. She claimed they formed a brotherhood called the Great White Lodge and lived in Tibet, sometimes as, and as, sometimes as she should suggest it, in the Himalayas. The masters, or Mahatmas, as she later termed them, following the suggestion of Damodar, uh, Damodar Mavlankar, an early Indian theosophist, were, in her opinion, magicians or possessors of the ancient wisdom which the Theosophical Society sought to revive. Blavatsky had, from before moving to India, redefined the words magic and magician and used them to convey quite the opposite of what they meant in modern times. In an article published before the foundation of the Theosophical Society, she had written, and I quote, the exercise of magical powers is the exercise of natural powers, but superior to the ordinary functions of nature, except for, ordinary, except for ignorant people. Magic is but a science, a profound knowledge of the occult forces in nature and of the laws governing the visible or invisible world. Spiritualism in the hands of an adept becomes magic, for he is learned, learned in the art of blending together the laws of the universe without breaking any of them and thereby violating nature. In the hands of an experienced media, medium, <coughs> excuse me, spiritualism becomes unconscious sorcery, for by allowing himself become the helpless tool of a variety of spirits of whom he knows nothing save what the latter permit, permit him to know, he opens, unknown to himself, a door of communication between the two worlds, through which emerge the blind forces of nature lurking in astral light. She would, I unquote, she would, in later writings, reiterate the same thing several times. In her first opus, The Isis Unveiled, the book that you uh, see over here, this is the first edition of The Isis Unveiled, and it's available here at the Cooper Collection uh, in this library. It was published in 1877, uh, in this book, Blavatsky claimed that magic is derived from the, uh, the word magic uh, is derived from the Sanskrit word maha or mahati, which means the great or wise, the, uh, the great or wise one, or the one anointed by the divine wisdom. Therefore, magician was a great or uh, was a great or extraordinary man, or a man well versed in the secret and esoteric knowledge, properly a sacerdote. She also said that, that uh, in her contemporary world, the meaning of the word magician has been wholly perverted. The uncorrupted significance of the word magic, according to her, or the meaning which it has in the minds of Oriental students and practitioners, was in existence in the East. She said in this book, The Isis Unveiled, the phenomena of natural magic to be witnessed in Siam, India, Egypt, and other Oriental countries bear no relationship whatsoever to sleight of hand. The one being an absolute physical effect due to the action of natural forces, the other a mere deceptive result obtained by dexterous manipulations supplemented with confederacy." I unquote. Relying heavily on descriptions of supernatural phenomena given by the French administrator, judge, and writer, Louis Jacoyot, who spent a number of years in India during the 19th century, she offered them as proof of the existence of ancient knowledge of magic in India. She claimed to have, uh, to have observed one such incident in which a fakir, a Syrian half-heathen, half-Christian from Kunankulam, Cochin state, which is uh, in south the southern uh, part of India, a reputed sorcerer, gave an exhibition of what Blavatsky called white magic. The man in broad daylight made a tiger, 
a monkey, and an oriole drawn down drowsy in front of a gathering of six European and one Indian man, uh, six Euro uh, European and Indian men, and there were two ladies in the gathering, including Blavatsky. This is a lie. She had never been to India while she was writing it. She went to India for the first time in 1879. She couldn't have seen this. And this possibly won't have happened. Uh, such were the abilities of the fakir that while he was overpowering the animals, he made flowers float about the room. And as someone complained of heat, he brought into being a shower of delicately perfumed, perfumed dew on the observers, which fell fast, drying instantly before touching the bodies of those present. Of those present. The magical powers, the use of which she so described, were, in her opinion, present in the ancient world, and magic, where magic was considered a divine science, which led to the participation in attributes of divinity itself. Therefore, an ancient science which modern savants were yet to discover was being discovered by Blavatsky herself. She, however, cautioned her readers from, that from the earliest times, magic had a double nature. There was divine magic, or white magic, and there was evil magic, or black magic. And she said, and I quote, in the oldest documents now in our possession, the Vedas, which is Aryan literature of ancient times. And the Vedas, as we see them now, weren't written. They were part of an oral culture. They were written much later. In the oldest documents now we are in our possession, the Vedas, and the older laws of Manu, which is the law code of Hindus, the ancient law code of Hindus, we find many magic, magical rites practiced and permitted, permitted by the Brahmins. Brahmins means Hindu priests. Having thus made a claim on Indian history, she added, magic is as old as man. It's impossible to name a time when it sprang into existence as to indicate what day the first man himself was born. At the time of the publication of this book, Isis Unveiled, it was thus evident that Blavatsky believed that India was the land of magical knowledge. And she went there in February, say, 1879. In India, she and Olcott faced a number of setbacks in their initial uh, few months, of which the most serious one was their fallout with Swami Dayanand Saraswati, a Hindu holy man and the founder of the Arya Samaj, a 19th century body to uh, reform Hinduism and Hindu society. They fell out in 1882. Dayananda wrote a, a scathing piece against the, the Theosophical Society titled Humbuggery of the Theosophists, in which he said, neither Colonel Alcott nor Madame Blavatsky know anything of yoga vidya, which he called occult science, as practiced by the yogis or the Hindu holy men of the old. They may know a little of mesmerism, as well as of the natural and physical sciences taught at Bombay institutions, especially the science of electricity, and that they may know the clever art of conjuring. But for them to say they perform their, uh, perform, that they perform their phenomena with their apparatus without any secret pre-arrangement pre arrangement, and solely through the forces existing in nature and by what they call willpower is to tell a lie. Besides Dayananda's serious accusation, one of the main reasons behind the differences between the Arya Samaj and the Theosophical Society was the latter's belief in magic. Blavatsky said that for Theosophists, magic was, as I already said, the science of the sciences, which meant the higher study of knowledge of nature and deep research into her hidden powers, those occult and mysterious laws which constitute the ultimate essence of very, uh, of very element. And she said that these, this knowledge of magic was to be found in Aryan philosophy and Aryan literature. While upholding such a view, she repeatedly stated that theosophists didn't believe in miracles. But they firmly believed in magic. To prove that such knowledge existed, she performed or produced, as theosophists said, inexplicable or magical phenomena from after arriving in Bombay, and always in the presence of, observ of observers. Their accounts soon started appearing in English language press in, press in India, bringing her instant fame. In addition, Blavatsky and Alcott used their mouthpiece, the Theosophist, a periodical they founded in 1879 to publicize the phenomena. 
For example, while in Bombay, the editor of the Amrita Bazaar Patrika, uh, an English language daily published from Calcutta, uh, the editor called Shishid Ghosh paid her a visit and asked her to duplicate objects at his request. Blavatsky, feigning reluctance and fatigue at first, took a mirror in her hands, turned around, and duplicated it within less than a minute in full view of her visitor. Using the publicity which such, in, in, uh, such phenomena brought her, uh, brought her, Blavatsky made friends and acquaintances with Indian princes and eminent and influential Europeans in India. Jill Rowe, the Australian historian of the, Theosophical Society, of the Theosophical Society, says that Blavatsky's Indian friends and followers had provided her with money, which she used in setting up the, the Theosophical Society headquarters in Adayar in Madras in December 1882. Madras is a colonial port city in the southeast coast of India. Alcott had, in the meanwhile, established contacts, <coughs> established contacts with Europeans of India, and soon after arriving in the country, he and Blavatsky corresponded with Alfred Parsi Sinet. By the way, this is their first residence in Bombay. And this is what later became uh, the headquarters of Theosophy, the global headquarters of Theosophy, Theosophy in Adayar, uh, in Madras. Madras has now been uh, renamed in India. It's called Chennai now. Blavatsky and Alcott had corresponded with Alfred Percy Sinet, the editor of The Pioneer, an Anglo-Indian English language daily published from the North Indian city of Allahabad. Sinet was influential within the European community in India and was, known, and was known for his proximity to the Viceroy of India, Lord Ripon, and other European high officials in civil and military administration. At his invitation in September 1880, Blavatsky and Alcott went to India. Simla is a colonial hill station built in the Himalayas and a place for summer sojourn of the viceroy and the high officials. Sinet said about this visit in his book, uh, The Occult World, and I quote, about the beginning of September 1880, Madame Blavatsky came to Simla as our guest. And in the course of the following six weeks, various phenomena occurred, which became the talk of all Anglo-India for a time and gave rise to some excited feeling on the part of persons who warmly espoused that they must be the result of imposture. Having arrived in Simla, Blavatsky produced, sorry, I unquote. Having <coughs> arrived in Simla, Blavatsky produced a number of phenomena. For example, he, she started by producing a note from the Mahatmas for Mrs. Sinet at her request. Then, on the 3rd of October, at a pic 3rd of October 1880, at a picnic, uh, she produced a cup and a saucer, that, that too belonging to a set, two bottles of drinking water, and a certificate of initiation into the Theosophical Society for a European army officer who, being impressed with her abilities, joined the society there itself. Having been, <coughs> having been uh, witness to the phenomena, Sinet came to the conclusion that the objects couldn't have appeared if they were not deposited by occult agency. He published descriptions, a description of the phenomena in the Pioneer, and later wrote about them in detail in his book, The Occult World, which was published in 1881. This helped Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society to become popular among Europeans in India. These were followed by what is known as the Bruch Incident, which received much wider publicity and turned Bob Blavatsky into a celebrity in the European circles. At a dinner hosted by Alan Octavian, Octavian Hume, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, that is, this is Sinet, and these are Sinet's books, uh, uh, The Occult World and, the Esoteric, uh, and Esoteric Buddhism, which were influential in finding theosophy its followers in late 19th century. And this is Alan Octavian Hume, Hume was an ICS officer, which means uh, an officer of the Indian Civil Service. And uh, he was extremely influential and very highly placed at the time when the incident, which I'm going to narrate, had occurred. And he was also the founder of the Indian National Congress, the first politi modern political party of India. Uh, and Hume is supposed to be, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in this way, being the founder of the Congress, is 
uh, credited with being the father of Indian nationalism in one way, though that's being debated now among historians. And this is a stamp which the government of India uh, brought out in 1973 in, uh, to honor Hume. Okay. So Alan Octavian Hume's residence, Hume was then a highly placed uh, officer of the Indian Civil Service. At his residence during dinner, Blavatsky asked, he asked Hume's wife whether she longed to find any of her lost belongings. Mrs. Hume said that she wished to, find, wished to find a brooch that her mother had given her, and she lost, lost the ornament after coming to India, having lent it to someone. Blavatsky made, made the ornament appear, appear <clears throat> after a while on the flower bed in Hume's garden, where it was found lying on the ground wrapped in secret paper, which Blavatsky used. Sinet and Hume wrote an account of the incident there itself and got it signed by nine people who witnessed it. Sinet published it in The Pioneer and it led automatically to a sensation. sensation. Later, he printed the account, of the account in the occult world and said that Blavatsky made solid, solid, objects, uh, <coughs> excuse me, solid objects appear by disintegrating them into infinitely minute particles, which were carried on the currents and then reintegrated at its destination. From, the time that, uh, from that time onwards, letters from Blavatsky's invisible masters started appearing in the mail of our friends and followers. There is sufficient evidence, as Bruce F. Campbell, the American historian, says, to suspect that these letters were in fact written by Blavatsky herself. During her time, the authorship, the authorship of these letters had been traced back to her, and she had been accused of deceit in their miraculous appearances. But to theosophists all over the world, they have been the evidence of the existence of masters. From after 1880, most of the letters from the masters were addressed to Sinet, and some to Hume, and the rest to other theosophists. The major majority of the letters bore the name of uh, two centers, Kut Humi and Morea. The letters were handwritten and were always in English, barring a few. They contained theosophical teachings. Sinet used them to write his book, Esoteric Buddhism, published in 1883. In addition, Blavatsky, Olcott, and Sinet used the Theosophist, their mouthpiece in India, to publicize teachings given in these, in these letters. The first Mahatma letter to Sinet had the name Kut Humi Lal Singh at its writer and contained a, contained a lengthy explanation behind the bright future of eating theosophy. The letters which followed had instructions on bringing Anglo-Indians within the folds of the society in India. Sinet and Hume replied to these letters, which had to be sent via Blavatsky to the masters. Letters from the masters were either, uh, I, sorry, letters from the masters either appear, appeared in the receiver's mailbox, or they dropped magically from the ceiling, or appeared mysteriously, mysteriously resting on the receiver's pillow. As the Theosophical Society moved to RDR in December 1882, the headquarters became the site of many such miracle, uh, magical phenomena. Most of them took place in a wooden shrine, which was a small cabinet, in which Mahatma letters materialized on request within seconds, within seconds and broken objects were restored to, the, to their previous undamaged state. Letters and notes from the Mahatmas also dropped magically from the walls and ceilings of the building, which were covered decoratively in glazed calico. For, for many, the Mahatma letters, combined with the sightings of the Mahatmas, firmed, firmed up belief in their existence, and Blavatsky's occult powers and occult and psychical powers became a matter of, uh, of, of, of immense importance in contemporary India. Sinet, who had publicized the Mahatma letters, claimed that he had seen one of the Mahatmas on the night of 19th October, uh, 19th October 1880. Blavatsky said that she had met her first, master, uh, first among her masters in London in 1851, a claim not supported by any evidence, and later to have studied occultism under him and the rest of the Brotherhood in Tibet in 1856-57 which is highly improbable, as the land was inaccessible to outsiders back then. She, however, claimed to be one of the initiates, that is a chela or a disciple, giving to others the occult knowledge that they in turn had given her. In America, 
After the founding of the Theosophical Society, Alcott said that one evening, while at Blavatsky's apartment, he had seen a Hindu walk in and disappear, taking after taking off his turban and giving it to him, indicating that he should go to India with Blavatsky. Alcott said that initially, Blavatsky introduced him to the African masters and later still to Indian masters. Indian theosophists corroborated such claims, offering eyewitness accounts of having seen the Mahatmas converse with, Blav with Blavatsky. Excuse me. One Indian, Indian theosophist named Mantradas Babaji Nagnath claimed to have seen Master Maurya with Blavatsky in the night of, uh, in one night in April 1881 in Bombay at, at about 10 p.m. He said, and I quote, one dark night while, taking the while talking in the company with other theosophists with Madame Blavatsky about 10 p.m. in the open veranda of, an upper, of the upper bungalow, a man six feet in height clad in white robe with a white rumal, that is handkerchief, or a fetta, which is scarf, on the head, made his appearance on a sudden, walking towards us through the garden adjacent to the bungalow from a point, a precipice, where there is no path for anyone to tread. Madame then rose up and told us to go inside the bungalow. So we went in. But we heard Madame, as, and he was talking for a minute to each other in an Eastern language unknown to us. Immediately after, we went out again to the veranda as we were called, but the brother had disappeared. Apparently, inexplicable incidents such as these and those which Blavats Blavatsky produced in Simla, publicized by Sinet in his books and in The Pioneer, created such a stir that the Society for Psychical Research, a body founded in Cambridge in 1882, led an investigation into them. Richard Hodgson, an Australian educated at the University of Cambridge carried out the investigation and in a report published in May, June 1885, accused Blavatsky and his followers of producing psychical, that is magical or inexplicable phenomena, practicing fraud. Okay, so these are two people, these are two people who are supposed to have, uh, on, the, on the right you see this uh, Indian man called Norindra Sen, who was a journalist based in Calcutta and he was the editor of a newspaper called The Indian Mirror, founded in the 1860s. And he is supposed to have been a disciple of one of the masters. He used to get letters from the masters. And he used to publicize these letters. He used to reprint those letters in his newspaper. And uh, in one of his reports, which I read here, uh, it's interesting to note that the membership fee of the, uh, the Theosophical Society back in, say, the 1880s was 10 rupees a year which was quite a, quite a bit of money back in those days. And to uh, subscribe to the Theosophist, the mouthpiece of the organization would cost you uh, eight rupees a year back, back in those days in India, which, was, which meant that basically it wasn't meant for consumption of the people who were not well healed. And uh, to your uh, uh, left, you see this man called, okay, that's to my left, to your right and to my left. Uh, this man called William H. Terry. William H. Terry was born in England, then he migrated to Australia. And he was a shopkeeper by profession. But he took an interest in uh, spiritualism, he, and he published, he edited and published this periodical called The Harbinger of Light from Melbourne, where he lived. And he's the man who is credited with introducing theosophy to Australians. He uh, uh, published news about theosoph the Theosophical Society, about Blavatsky, her uh, uh, phenomena, and he advertised the Theosophist. Uh, and he was a dealer uh, for the uh, periodical over here in Australia. So that's how, with his agency, uh, Theosophy, Theos Theosophy and Theosophical Society reached Australia. This is another Theosophical periodical, which was published from Sydney in Australia, uh, which I found in uh, the library over here. I wasn't aware of uh, this periodical earlier. And, uh, very interestingly, it's also a titled Magic. Uh, OK. This is a book. These are two books with letters of the Mahatmas were reprinted. Uh, the red book that you see over here, it's, it contains almost all the letters that, that were sent to AP Sinet. And you can find this on, uh, at the Cooper collection in uh, this library. And this one also, the C. Gina Rajadasa book, which is a, 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 a collection of a select few of the letters that, that were received from the Mahatmas. 
And this is a, uh, an artist impression of the Mahatmas. So in the middle, the man standing uh, right behind Blavatsky is Maurya. Uh, then uh, there's Kuthumi, and there's another Prince Ragosi. Uh, these three are supposed to be uh, Mahatmas. And there was another Mahatma also, uh, whose name was Jewel Kool. But I haven't, found, I haven't been able to find any um, artist impression of how the Mahatma looked. OK. This is a quote from Blavatsky where she stresses that she had been in touch with the Mahatmas and seen the Mahatmas from 1851 onwards, which was published uh, in a book uh, written by one of, Indian, one of the Indian theosophists, uh, published in 1951. This is, the, uh, this is a, a photo of early uh, Theosophical Society in India, taken in Adayar. And uh, uh, it has Blavatsky, Olcott, and all the important Theosophists uh, who contributed to the popularity and uh, the, the growth of the society in India. And this is the man I'm talking about, Richard Hodgson. And this is the report that I'm going to refer to. Uh, the Hodgson Report, which exposed Blavatsky, which is available here in the special collections of this library. Uh, all right. So the Society for Psychical Research, a body founded in Cambridge in 1882, led an investigation. Richard Hodgson, an Australian educated at the University of Cambridge, carried out the investigation and in a report published in May, June 1885, accused Blavatsky and his fellow theos theosophists of producing psychical or magical phenomena by practicing fraud. Hodgson had stayed at the Theosophical headquarters in Adayar and concluded, having finished his investigation, that there could be no doubt whatever that the Theosophical phenomena were a part of a huge fraudulent system worked by Madame Blavatsky with the assistance of Coulombs and other confederates. Emma Coulomb, who had been a housekeeper at the Theosophical headquarters in Adayar, had published <coughs> Blavatsky's letters addressed to her in the, Madra, in the Madras Christian College magazine, which showed that she had instructed her to produce what she called psychical phenomena. Coulomb and her French husband, who worked as a handyman in Adyar, had followed out with Blavatsky. Her accusations aided Hodgson greatly, who, after investigating Blavatsky's phenomena and interviewing theosophists at Adyar, gave a detailed account of how she misdirected the Synods and the Humes in Simla and made objects appear by trickery, performed with careful planning. For example, the cup and saucer, which appeared at, the pic at a picnic spot on a hill in Simla, were in fact buried over there by Blavatsky's servant. Uh, similarly, uh, Blavatsky and Olcott had come into possession of Mrs. Hume's lost brooch while in Bombay and knew how much it meant to her. Likewise, the astral appearance of Mahatmas were performed with a dummy, which Blavatsky had endearingly christened Christoph or Christofolo, which was hoisted on a bamboo in the night to create the illusion of a man floating in thin air. And British calligraphy experts confirmed that the handwriting in Mahatma letters were indeed that of Blavatsky. The shrine uh, at Adyar proved to be a device which had a panel which could open secretly, secretly like the false bottom of a magician's basket, of a stage magician's basket. And it was connected to Blavatsky's chamber, chamber through a narrow passage cut through a wall. Objects which appeared in it thus were placed to fool people. And it was removed and destroyed by theosophists when charges of fraud were, level, were, level, uh, were leveled against Blavatsky and them. Uh, The letters of Emma Coulomb and the Hudson Report was a, were a serious setback for Blavatsky. And having learned the preliminary findings of Hudson's report, in December 1884, Blavatsky left India for good in March 1885. Her departure from India marked the end of the phase of magical phenomena. Though a few Mahatma letters appeared in similar fashion even after her death, the accusation of having been a fraud notwithstanding as Joy Dixon, the feminist historian, says, Blavatsky re-emerged in 1888 with the publication of her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine. OK, so this is a, this is a report which Hodgson published 
in uh, The Age Melbourne in September 12, 1885, in which he produces the gist of his expose on Blavatsky. The report is published from the third to the seventh column of the newspaper. And I found this on Truth over here. Blavatsky reemerged in 1888 with the publication of her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine. And it turned her in, <clears throat> into the leading occult teacher of, her, of the world, and the Theosophical Society continued to grow and continued to spread to other countries, to new countries. Published in two volumes and spread over 1,400 pages, The Secret Doctrine was, like her earlier books, uh, an exceptional piece of work. Blavatsky wrote it combining the religious ideas of the then contemporary scientific discoveries about Earth, evolution, and the origins of human society and religions. The first volume, titled Cosmogenesis, is an exposition of the evolution of the cosmos, and the second one, Anthropogenesis, is that of the evolution of man. Concepts taken from Hinduism and Buddhism constitute the core of ideas of the secret doctrine. The first among them is the Hindu and Buddhist concept of the earthly world as an illusion, or maya. The concept second, the concept of karma, or having to suffer from the result of one's actions of the past. Third, reincarnation. And fourth, the concept of the inner or divine man and his outer or terrestrial self, in which the, form, uh, 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 <coughs> uh, the former are perpetually at odds with the, with the latter. While Blavatsky was accused of plagiarism, as in the past, for secret doctrine, it is, in the opinion of Bruce Campbell, the most important work on occultism of the 19th century. It found a large number of readers from upper and middle classes of the West, as it gave meaning to individual destiny in a conceptual framework made up with Indian religions. Following the secret doctrine, Blavatsky published another short book, The Voice of Silence. In it, she used two ideas of, Brahm, of uh, uh, Brahma, Atman, Brahma or Atman, and Nirvana. Using, again, Hindu and Buddhist beliefs, she underscored the illusory nature of human life on Earth, uh, and said that, like a yogi, the aim of man should be to unite with the higher self, or Atman, for that would mean Nirvana, or true liberation. In the book, Blavatsky reiterated the theosophical belief in the existence of hidden wisdom, which is to be found in Indian religions. The publication of the secret doctrine and the voice of silence marked a transition in, in Blavatsky's life and that too, and, and that uh, uh, of the theosophical society. Unlike before, she, never she no longer relied on production of, of inexplicable phenomena for fame and following. Rather, the large and varied corpus of ideas which she, uh, for which she relied openly on Hinduism and Buddhism became the reason by people looking up to her. It implied that having been, having been to India, having produced mysterious phenomena as proof of her knowledge of magic, she was now re revealing the hidden ancient wisdom to the modern world. It, according to Robert S. Elwood, signified the emergence of the Theosophical Society as the initiator of what would become later, New Age, religious, uh, New Age religion in the 19th century. Blavatsky died in 1891, handing over responsibility of running the Theosophical Society to Annie Besant, an English lady, a former so socialist. Besant carried on Blavatsky's task, and she, uh, 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 she publicized many of her ideas through her writings. For example, in an article written in 18, 1909, Besant, in a manner reminiscent of Blavatsky, said, said that there were black and white magic in India. And she added another kind of magic to this list called gray magic. She said in that article, and I quote, Western people will never understand Eastern life unless they can appreciate intelligently, sympathic, sympathetically, the view of nature universally held. From this magic, or the great science, is purely a natural science, in which human will, strengthened to a high degree and directed by enlightened intelligence, controls forces not generally understood and works by methods unknown to the profane. Theosophists after Besant carried forward the task of 
using Blavatsky's ideas to popularize the Theosophical Society. I'm going to cite two such books. The first one was written by C.W. Ledbetter, the Christian priest who turned to Theosophy and was Besant's protege. He was a leading Theosophist in the early 20th century, and he came to Australia, and he settled over here from 1916. He lived in Sydney, and he uh, 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 spread the word of Theosophy in this country. Borrowing heavily from the Irish Unveiled and the Secret Doctrine, Ledbetter presented to readers Blavatsky's scheme of cosmogenesis and anthropogenesis. He said that man is, a, and I quote, a monad, a spark of divine, I unquote, whose personality has three vehicles, namely mental, astral, and physical. His physical body laid aside, is laid aside when he dies, after attaining fulfillment, his, in his mental body, he comes back to Earth again for physical life, meaning he's reincarnated. Similarly, a Theosophical manual produced OK, so this is Ledbetter. Uh, uh, in this photograph, uh, the bearded gentleman standing next to Annie Besant. Similarly, a Theosophical manual published under the guidance of Catherine Tingley an American from Point Loma, California, stressed Blavatsky's teachings. The book was written in 1907. It went through several editions and was reprinted in 1921, proving its popularity. It reminded readers of the material world they lived, that the material world they lived in was an illusory one, quoting the Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus, the holy book of the Hindus. And citing Indian mythology, it said that man was pure spirit, or Atma, sheathed in a little body. And theosophy, or wisdom religion, reminds, reminds us that he, in spirit, is a little image of the universe. Now I conclude with these words. Blavatsky, Blavatsky's magical phenomena and her redefinition of magic have been, from her lifetime, matters of immense controversy. The number of those who believed in her is matched equally by, the, by, her, by that of her retractors and debunkers. Notwithstanding the fact that she was exposed as a fraud by Hudson in 1884-85, her popularity grew all over the world. She did what other Western spiritualists could, couldn't possibly accomplish. That is to turn spiritualism to Indian religions and mythology to create a belief in the undying human spirit. For Blavatsky, Olcott, and their followers, India was magical, but not for the purpose of general entertainment or that of sensation in the press. They, and especially Blavatsky, transformed Indian magic into an ancient and higher knowledge to look beyond the binary of normal or natural versus paranormal or supernatural. In this way, she turned theosophy into what Janet Oppenheim says, a surrogate faith, which, in Robert uh, Elwood's opinion, led to re uh, New Age religious movements and counterculture from after 1950. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sagata. I have so many questions. What an amazing woman to have been traveling independently around the world at such a young age, dumping her husband after 12 months of marriage at the age of 18. Um, quite an adventurous. But what was her motivation? Why do you think she, she was driven to, to um, explore magic and set up the Theosophical Society? Uh, well, Blavatsky was a maverick from very young age, and uh, she is what historians call uh, the marginal elite of a society. She is somebody who challenged the customs and the beliefs of the times we live of, of, of the times that she lived in. And uh, though she uh, is exposed uh, as a fraud, as a liar, as somebody who pre performed tricks and uh, passed them on as uh, her uh, uh, as examples of her psychic powers. 
at the end of the day, Blavatsky managed to inspire an entire generation, and especially women during the 19th century, to go uh, uh, off the beaten track. And it was possible because uh, the historical, I just uh, 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 highlight two things. First, it, this was made possible, as historians say, due to Blavatsky's childhood. Blavatsky had a very uh, different childhood as compared to other aristocrat aristocratic, aristocratic Russian children of her times. She was growing up in an occult library. She had uh, powers of imagination which people marveled at. And then Blavatsky had this ability of challenging customs. Uh, this again is the theme that the question that you ask is a theme which comes up repeatedly on books on her. That at the age of 18, she leaves home. And let's remember she's a Russian. Uh, East European society, as compared to contemporary West European society, was far more conservative. So it was a very courageous act of her to act on her will to leave home to seek uh, what she wanted. And it's while she was journeying through North of Africa, South of Europe, Eastern Europe, that she met a number of people who in turn influenced her to take through uh, uh, first to spiritualism and then turn to theosophy. And theosophy, as I realized, was, as, uh, during my research over here, as I realized, was uh, not only a, a, a spiritualist movement of the late 19th century. There were several organizations in the late 19th century of spiritualists, none of which uh, have had the same glorious run as the Theosophical Society, which exists still date, by the way. Uh, I found that there's a rather active Theosophical Society in Australia, in Sydney. I haven't been able to go to Sydney, but I, if I manage to travel to Sydney sometime in the future, I'd like to see what the Theosophical Society uh, in Australia looks like and what they do. And uh, so it's basically, she was giving the, her contemporary society a body of ideas which would become what from 1950s onwards we know as counterculture in the sense that she was challenging not only the customs, she was challenging beliefs, the foundation of beliefs. And come to think about it, she was opposing dogma she was, uh, she was extremely democratic in theosophy, in the sense that theosophical society, which this is a thing which I couldn't touch upon during my talk, uh, because of the, 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 the long history of the society, it's very difficult to compress everything within a 40 minute talk. Uh, the theosophical society is an extremely democratic society. And that's why, I mean, from the eight, late 1880s, there are many dissensions within the society. the society. The society itself breaks up into many units, and these units, called branches, they perform almost independently of each other. There is no high priest of the society. So Blavatsky, in, 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 in many senses, was far ahead of our times. Thank you. Does anyone have a question before we conclude for today? Well, while you're thinking of that, we have had one question online, which is around um, whether there will be a bibliography available. Now, am I right in thinking, Sagata, that all the references you showed us today were from the Cooper collection? Well, some from the main reading room also. Okay. We should be able to add a link to at least the Cooper collection, of which there's over 3,000 items, um, into the, the uh, Facebook chat for you to follow up. Um, were there any other questions today? Then before we wrap up, one of the joys of streaming is that people all around the world can watch us. And I'd like to say hello to Sagata's family who are watching us from Kolkata. And um, he'll be home soon. And thank you all for coming today. We have another fellowship lecture coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, time. It will be on the Thursday, the 10th of November, and will be delivered by Dr. Kate Warren. And of course, if you want to catch up on any of our lectures, if you want to explore the collection, uh, just pop online to the National Library Catalogue. Thank you all for coming today, and special thanks to Dr. Sagata Nandi for sharing your research with us. Thank you. Thank you.